what I think I'd like to do is really highlight both from the scenarios project that we um, were so um, really, I think, um, learned a lot from yesterday, but also to challenge the group as a whole to, to think in new ways and perhaps to consider a new alternatives. And I want to start with um, a question um, to the group about how, how do we understand the current multilateral IP regime? What lessons have we learned um, from that? And I guess most importantly for me, what consequences can we avoid? Uh, there's nothing more painful, I think, particularly on the African continent than to observe repeated cycles of the same mistakes over and over again. And I think that we see this um, in ways that are particularly pernicious um, in the IP field. Um, yesterday, Chidi was talking in the scenario about Sincerely African, um, about indigenous and locally relevant innovation. And I want to say something that I've perhaps said uh, repeatedly over the years, and that is the question is not so much whether there is innovation and creativity on the continent, but the way the intellectual property system counts, what counts is creativity and innovation. Um, it's not so much that it doesn't exist, um, but that it does not count. And I want to challenge us that this is not just an issue of methodology. It's not just an issue of categories of intellectual property. It is very systematically an issue of manipulation. Um, not methodology, but I repeat, manipulation. I think for all of us as students of intellectual property, we want to remember that these IP categories are not static. They are dynamic. They are not scientific. They are both political and cultural and social. And so we have to be careful not to get trapped in a frame that is both um, largely becoming obsolete, but also has clearly shown its weaknesses and its capacity to capture the various forms of innovation um, that occur. The, the essence of the multilateral system, certainly what I call the fourth wave of this system, is not really harmonization. Um, and it's not really about neutral values or neutral doctrines. Fundamentally, it is a de-anchoring of intellectual property norms from any jurisdictional concept of the public interest. Unless, of course, you end up in a um, judicial court or other um, dispute resolution forum. And so my first challenge of the morning is that we must, as, as scholars, as students, as activists, as policymakers, those who are concerned about access, innovation, development, we must avoid building systems of consent and compliance around what are essentially architectures of command and control. I think no matter how we reframe the debate, no matter how we reconstitute the serious questions about access to knowledge, about innovation, about development, and about the, about the public interest, we are dealing fundamentally with a system that is about command and control. And the architectures of limitations and exceptions, architectures of, of open innovation, creative commons, all of the wonderful virtuous ways in which we are bridging the gap between the public interest and the IP system are still systems of consent and compliance, fundamentally. And if we are going to eventually move beyond that to embrace a future that encompasses the scenarios that we uh, were exposed to yesterday, we are going to have to rethink some of the fundamental rules. And so, my focus this morning has really been about this innovation paradox, as I've been thinking about it. That there are two frames, to uh, use a word that Ahmed uh, loves to use and that I have borrowed from him in the spirit of openness, <laughs> that um, you know, Africa creates, and creates an awful lot. It innovates, um, and frankly, um, from my country of my birth, Nigeria, I am often struck that the nation just exists given the amount of and the nature of challenges faced by most countries on the African continent. It would not survive but for some capacity to innovate, 
to adapt, to respond to what are extreme human challenges. And whether you are the Maasai in Kenya or Tanzania, whether you are the Ashanti in Ghana, the Yoruba in Nigeria, it doesn't matter really where you're from. The continent with its environmental, institutional, infrastructural, political, ethnic, religious challenges requires innovation as a matter of survival. And we think of innovation merely about technologies, but technologies are responses to legal innovations. Technologies have to respond to social innovations. That's why social media is such a hit, right? It's not because it's a technology, it's because it's a system that grafts on to the way human beings interact. So this paradox is about a system that says we recognize innovation and yet it's not captured in the innovation that occurs on the continent. There's another paradox frame, and that is a paradox frame that is actually quite troubling to me. That every time you hear about a development challenge, there's a technological component. And it doesn't matter what form you're dealing with, but every development challenge has a technological answer. And yet, the conversations about development, the policies around development, particularly in IGOs, really do not engage seriously the structural challenges in the intellectual property system. The system has been irresponsive. And I'm gonna mention just a few examples um, to highlight this paradox, of which there are many. What we do know today, that we may not have known so clearly as a global community 20 years ago, um, are these propositions about IP that fundamentally are just untrue. In fact, I'm using the word paradox because I wanna be nice this morning. They're just lies, right? And um, my uh, law school classmate and dear friend, um, Neva Elkin Corin and I were talking a few years ago, she may not even remember, and, and we were talking about how tired we were of starting our intellectual property classes with the proposition that people create because there are incentives to create, right? Because we know that this is fundamentally not the case. The propositions that IP advances development, encourages foreign investment, encourages technology transfer, knowledge dissemination, innovation, it captures value, redirects R&D resources, none of these are reflected in what are fundamentally contradictory outcomes. Um, if you look in fact at countries like um, Malta, which um, uh, Margot was just reminding me of this morning, Malta did something really interesting. Malta said, listen, we have no pharmaceutical patents and use the lack of pharmaceutical patents to invite five generic pharmaceutical companies to invest on that tiny little island and has become a source of exports of generics, right? That there are ways in which the system in terms of its normative architecture is completely belied by the realities of how it can be used and by the results that are there. One of the things that I think we have to confront is the story about incentives. Because it's a story that we heard the last two days at the Open Air Conference, and it's a story that I think the Global Congress must confront head on. This notion that we see in TRIPS, that we see in TPP, that we see all over the place, that incentives are the beginning of the IP system, is a difficult one to overcome, but it must at least be undermined. The predominance of incentives as this theoretical driver of creativity within the IP system really profoundly affects the willingness of developed countries to tamper with the system in any meaningful way. Um, at the end of the day, what we see is that human need, social values, cultural institutions, public policies are all overridden by this ecosystem that says we must preserve incentives instead of identifying humanity-driven responses to material environments around us. What we see in many ways is that the market has come to define the public interest. And this is a paradox. Not only is it a paradox, it's inherently contradictory. Because we do know that regulatory systems are not market-driven, right? They are responses to market inequities. Other propositions within this normative architecture that we have to confront is this notion that we must have returns in a particular form, 
in a particular way within a particular time, otherwise the system itself will collapse. We think about returns principally as monetary, but we know that this is not true, right? We know that attribution is almost more powerful, certainly in the scientific field, certainly in Africa, much more powerful than, um, than capital. We know obviously that returns are not guaranteed, otherwise our entire system in the United States in which firms amass IP portfolios just so that they can generate money um, and investment from venture capitalists who themselves have structured business models in order to have insurance if in fact that company fails. Returns are not guaranteed. We think about returns as technological, but in fact as we heard yesterday and as we most of us know, most patents are really never exploited. We think of returns as information or knowledge dissemination, but most patent scholars know that patents don't teach you anything really. We th think of returns as development, but for those of you who are copyright scholars, Maricela is somewhere here, you know that last year was the 100th year of copyright, was it last year? In Africa, 100 years of copyright. I don't think anybody would say that copyright has really accomplished the sorts of things on the continent that we would have been taught in our classrooms. So a couple of things that I want to leave with the audience today and hopefully stimulate some thought, um, because it's not the gap between theory and practice, it's not even the gap between values and politics that concerns me the most. It's the gap between what concerns us today and where we want to be tomorrow. That is the fundamental question I think of today. And I wanna leave you with a couple of terms um, that I've been playing with in my own work, distributed innovation, and something that I refer to as disintermediated public interest. First, I think that it's important to note that what serves the local public interest on the African continent can serve the global public interest as well. In fact, uh, Jerry Reichman, um, in a series of articles, has talked about the role of developing countries as leaders in ensuring that the innovation ecosystem, in fact, remains robust. I think it's important to recognize that innovation occurs across multiple platforms, but investments in innovation still have to be anchored in the local. We're not going to export the capacity to innovate to meet local needs. It must happen on the continent. I think it's important, third, to note that multilateralism through harmonization is really just a means of outsourcing public interest and you know, sort of making it secondary to a system in which processes and methods and ultimately institutions undermine the continent's capacity to redirect knowledge to address local realities. And I think Malta's example, again, really strikes home, in particular because it brought the exact kind of investment that Malta needed, but frankly, that the world needs as well. Fourthly, the public interest must value innovation and make it relevant to existing material conditions. Innovation is not innovation if it does not improve human capacity to respond to the needs of the day. It is not innovation. Innovation is not what happens 20 years from now to meet needs that don't exist today. It starts today with what exists today, with the demands of today. I think it's important, fifthly, to note that most IP norms are static. It's the institutions, as Peter Drajos reminded us yesterday, it's the institutions that are versatile. Most of the developments that we have seen in intellectual property in the last 20 years have not come from the texts of the statutes or from the texts of the treaties. They have come from local institutions looking at a set of facts and circumstances and saying this is not what the system was designed to do. Institutions are versatile, and institutions are one of the weakest points on the African continent, and we must begin to think about institutions, institutions, institutions. The public interest, in my view, is undeniably the responsibility of the innovation infrastructure in any continent, in any country. Um, and that means educational institutions, regulatory institutions must work in combination, in concert. I think Ahmed was making this point about coherence and alignment um, at the international, national, and regional. I actually think we begin within the national infrastructural system to find that coherence. And to um, 
a point that I think Ahmed also referred to, intergovernmental institutions and regional organizations must become arbiters of the public interest. They are not just custodians. And um, my good friend, who, well, I can't call my good friend, I just met him two days ago, but Fernando, someplace here, uh, the Director General of Aripo. And I want to challenge these regional organizations, whether it's PIPO or REPO or API, whatever PI it is there, whatever it is, that you are not just custodians. You're not inactive, passive participants facilitating you know, bureaucratic processes. You are arbiters of the public interest. And when national institutions fail, we look to the regional institutions to pick up, especially in a continent like Africa. And I would say it is disheartening to read the charters of the regional organizations that govern IP because it reads just like the charter of WIPO. That is not why regional institutions are anchored in a regional territory. So I want to leave you with something uh, both that bridges the Open Air Congress and, or the Open Air Conference and the Global Congress, and that is the possibility of a fourth scenario. From, <laughs> from wireless engagement to the informal being the new normal to being sincerely Africa, I think we must have a fourth scenario. And that fourth scenario starts first with a couple of cautions, that we must be cautioned in appropriating methodologies and taxonomies of IP regimes that are designed around specific industry dynamics and an international architecture that ultimately is just about competition, not about innovation. Competitive advantage, principally. I think our new scenarios for the future must engage current prospects for participating both in local and global innovation circles. I think that we have to have a systemic, and uh, Peter said this yesterday as well, a systemic resistance to, to this tendency to cut off and excise value for Africa, from Africa, from the formal knowledge systems. There is this pervasive methodology that basically says that normative values that govern innovation in certain parts of the world are less valuable, right, than those that govern others. We must have a fourth scenario that measures innovation welfare by the consequences of the IP regime on social policies and thus avoids what I call structural unilateralism because that's really what our multilateral system is about today. It's about a unilateral effort to super design a system that works for certain particular um, regions and not others. So this fourth scenario we might call a concerted collaborative approach. Our three scenarios from two days ago are organically driven. They're dynamic, they're evolutionary. This fourth scenario is designed to overcome structural unilateralism with concerted collaboration. It's what I view as a policy, a doctrinal, and a systematic framework in which IP rights are just one of many different tools to deal with access to knowledge, to meet innovation needs, to drive and to stimulate um, development. It is part of developing an ecosystem in which persons and communities can foster, appropriate, share, reinvent, and over time respond to the needs of their communities. And so I'm going to leave you with four elements of that fourth scenario. We have transnational systems of production, distribution. They're going to require transnational systems of innovation. Bottom line, innovation is not local, it's global. We have to get on that boat. And that means we have to have seamless knowledge flows. So limitations and exceptions are going to remain critical, but so is openness. Second, we have to focus on terms of participation and the systems of returns. These are going to be much more important than the kind, the nature, or the form of the knowledge in question. It is fundamentally a move from property to contracts. So I want to really challenge the Global Congress we are stuck in a property framework. Innovation is moving to contracts, and so frankly is IP licensing, all about contracts. For third, we have to understand the role of IP in the terms that really allow communities to participate, to contribute, and to share in the returns. And last, I think that regional institutions have a unique opportunity to play a vital, vital role in what is going to eventually be a virtuous or, fi frankly, in some places, a non-virtuous economy. We're going to have new regionalisms 
not about geography, but about interests. We're going to have production processes being protected rather than just products. Kente cloth may come from China to the horror of my Ghanaian mother. Rap music may come from Russia to the horror of the African American community. Trademarks, which we hardly talk about in the Congress, will become significant as services overtake products in global trade. Courts are going to become vital because they're the ones that will be versatile as other dispute resolution mechanisms. And intellectual property, ultimately, and innovation will be about who gets to participate, how, and at what price. The public interest, at the end of the day, will be about making sure that Africans, <coughs> African peoples, get to participate at a price that they can afford to pay. Thank you. <laughs>